COVID-19 vaccines allow the US and Europe to reopen for business, but countries in Africa lag behind. And the jabs sent to the continent aren't recognized for travel in Europe. So will a vaccine curtain end up dividing rich and poor nations? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. So COVID-19 vaccines are vital for controlling the pandemic, as we know. Widespread immunization is allowing parts of the world, including the US and Europe, to reopen for tourism and trade. But it's a different story in developing nations. Millions of people across Africa are still waiting to receive their first jabs. The WHO warns the continent is facing an extremely aggressive third wave. The African Union's COVID-19 envoy has strongly criticized Europe for failing to deliver the millions of doses it promised. We'll bring in our guests in a moment, but first this report from Victoria Gatenby. Marie, a 57-year-old mother of five, has come to this clinic in Kinshasa to get her second jab of the AstraZeneca vaccine. The Democratic Republic of Congo is suffering from a third surge of coronavirus infections, as are many other parts of Africa. It's good for us to protect ourselves as we are experiencing this third wave of COVID-19. It's important we receive this vaccine because in doing so, we'll also save others. She's one of the lucky ones. Only 1% of people across the continent have been inoculated. While richer, vaccinated countries are reopening their economies, African hospitals are becoming overwhelmed, oxygen supplies are running low, and the virus is spreading to rural areas. The man in charge of securing doses for the continent has criticized Europe, saying it's failed to deliver a single vaccine from the millions it promised. Not a single dose, not one vial, has left a European factory for Africa. OK, when we've gone to talk to their manufacturers, they tell us that they are completely maxed out meeting the needs of Europe. 5.5 million infections have been confirmed among the continent's 1.3 billion people. COVAX promised to deliver 700 million doses to Africa by December, but so far just 65 million have actually arrived. Rich countries like the UK, like the G7, um, just are, are putting the, the, the profit of pharmaceutical companies above public health, but not by not pushing companies to share their technology so that others in, in developing countries can produce the vaccines. So we are under you know, the mercy of, of pharmaceutical companies. The head of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says there's been a 23% increase in the number of COVID-related deaths in the past week and warns unless the continent can secure a regular supply of vaccines, the consequences will be catastrophic. Victoria Gatenby, Al Jazeera. And the African Union is warning of global inequality even after people receive their jabs. Most of its doses come from the UN-backed COVAX scheme, which relies on the Indian-made AstraZeneca dose called Covishield. That is not recognized by the EU's new vaccine passport for travel. Eight European states have reportedly agreed to accept Covishield after pressure from India. But the EU hasn't approved Russian or Chinese-made vaccines either. COVAX says this risks dividing the world into two tiers. All right, let's bring in our guests into the show. We have joining us from Addis Ababa, John Nkengasong, director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In Avellino in Italy, Gloria Tagliani, professor of infectious diseases at La Sapienza University of Rome. And in London, Max Lawson, head of inequality policy at Oxfam International. Warm welcome to you all. If I could start with Gloria in Italy. So why is the EU in excluding some vaccines like Covishield, which is, of course, just a variant of AstraZeneca, but made in India? Well, the question is very interesting because we really don't know exactly what, what the reason is. 
um, apparently the declaration of the uh, EMEA uh, society, the EMEA organization, was that the, the factory where the vaccine is uh, going to is, is produced is not uh, uh, perfectly uh, adequate for production of this kind of vaccine, or at least has not been certificated in a proper way. Does that this suggest, Chloe, if I could jump in, does that suggest that the vaccines are not effective? Well, this is not be proved. This is not proved at all. Uh, the point is, uh, <clears throat> uh, the um, Serum Institute, which produces the vaccine, the COVID shield, uh, is the the most relevant uh, uh, factory for uh, vaccine production all over the world. Uh, just to remember that 60% of children are vaccinated with vaccines produced by this uh, company. So it's, it, it seems a, at least a, a little bit uh, funny that um, uh, in, in, in this condition of urgency, the factory is considered not uh, uh, not enough proved to be uh, capable of producing good vaccines. All right. And the, the, on the other side, we should test first the efficacy of, and safety of vaccines before right. uh, refusing them. All right. Let me take that point to John Nkangasong in Addis Ababa. So if the European Union has some doubts, has some questions, about the standards or the certification of the factory that's manufacturing the Indian variant of AstraZeneca. Is it fair enough that they should hold off for now on, uh, from putting the Shield vaccine on the approved list? I think we have been extremely surprised by that behaviour. And uh, the COVID shield vaccine has been approved as part of the collection of vaccines from the COVAX, which is the mechanism supported by WHO, Gavi, and, and the CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness uh, Innovation. And the, uh, this vaccine has been paid for by the European taxpayers' money. And uh, we all know that WHO has given the uh, emergency use authorization for this vaccine. So I remain completely at loss as to why such uh, behavior. Uh, we've always maintained that we should, the only way that we will defeat this pandemic is to use science to drive our policies and action. And I, I find no science behind these decisions. And I really call on the European uh, Union to re uh, reverse that uh, decision uh, almost immediately because it is creating a lot of harm to the people that have received the vaccine in Africa and the global south. Tell, tell us more about that harm, John. What does that mean for people? That means that people, just the level of anxiety, once that decision was made over the week, I can tell you that many ministers have called me, uh, so many people in the communities have reached out to me and they express a lot of anxiety with respect to their inability to travel to Europe for several reasons. We are a highly interconnected world mm -hmm. and uh, Europe and Africa all move, the movement across the two continents is extremely uh, 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 important. And because of that, people cannot move to Europe. It creates harm, uh, both social harm and economic harm uh, to the populations. I think that is something that we uh, strongly uh, uh, encourage the Europeans to look at that decision. All right. and, and it also affects the ability for uh, the confidence that people are investing in the, the vaccines that are available. Each time we behave that way, it creates and erodes a, a lot of uh, confidence in the vaccines roll our programs. Right, right. Let me bring Max into the discussion. Max, it, the world was worried or concerned with a divide emerging between the haves and the haves, have nots when it comes to vaccines. Is there now a new divide emerging, even between those who've had vaccines, who can call them the vaccinated and the vaccinated light or something like that? Oh, it seems. I think there is a long history, sadly, in this COVID response of what I think we should call it what it is. It's a structural racism. It's the European North looking after themselves and this implicit sense that brown people in the global south are incapable of making vaccines. When in fact, you know, when COVID hit, 60 percent of the world's vaccines are made uh, in India. We have competent, really world-class producers 
in developing countries all over the world. And these are the same producers who are waiting for the vaccine recipes that are being held under lock and key by Pfizer, Moderna, BioNTech. So sadly, the Europeans are looking after themselves once again. So yes, we may have this divide over vaccine passports, but it's it's a much more substantial thing we hear, we have here. Let, we let have me play devil's advocate, part-time. Max, and jump in and say, well, from the EU perspective, I'm sure they would argue that this, this is not about different parts of the world or races. This is simply about science. And if certain factories are not up to standard, why should the European Union rush in to certify them? These factories, the Serum Institute has been fully approved by the WHO, by COVAX. Uh, it is absolutely not the case. That, as, as John said, it's completely unheard of that the, the European Union should decide that they have somehow a, a higher standard. I think this is politically driven. I think it's because it's seen as the British vaccine. They don't like it. I think there's politics in all of this. And I think there is racism in there, too. I think the Europeans have a very, very poor record on this. Look at Chancellor Merkel. She is blocking moves at the WTO to share the vaccine recipes. BioNTech is a German firm. They have one of the most successful vaccines together with Pfizer. They've sold virtually no vaccines in the developing world, virtually none for Africa. That's appalling. That's a crime of historical proportions. When we look at the third wave sweeping through countries like Uganda, it's absolutely disgusting, to be honest, that you see the Europeans looking after themselves once again. And it, it, it just makes me really, really angry. And I think they should look to themselves and they should share the vaccine recipes as fast as possible and allow developing countries to make themselves safe. Let me take a point back to Gloria. This whole issue, it kind of begs the question about how much policy coordination there is in the EU right now. Because as Max pointed out, you have a situation on the one hand where the EU is saying, you know, we're not sure about this vaccination. And yet... The same EU has been funding the COVAX program, the UN's WHO COVAX program, which gets this vaccination, it funds getting this vaccination out to the rest of the world that they're now saying they're not sure about. How much coordination is there between the EU and the WHO on these kinds of issues? How much coordination is there between EU countries themselves? Some of the EU nations have approved the same COVID shield that the EU as a whole is saying they're not sure about. Well, it, given that it's totally legitimate for each <clears throat> regulatory authority to independently carry out the approval process for drugs and vaccines and whatsoever, um, apparently at the moment we have a problem of coordination uh, because uh, the European Union uh, states that the vaccine should not be used and recognized but at the same time, Austria, Germany, Slovenia, Greece, Ireland, Spain, and apparently Estonia, Switzerland, and Iceland uh, approve Shield as a proper and effective and safe vaccine. Therefore, in a, in a time in which, in a moment in which um, there should be a unique way to face the pandemic uh, emergency, Apparently, there is large space space for each country or each uh, of different countries to behave in a different way, which is not something uh, helpful to uh, properly manage the emergency and properly manage the urgency of uh, covering the largest part possible parts of human beings with a good vaccine. John, I want to come back to you on a point you mentioned about the harm this could do economically as well. What it, will it mean for the developing world if a kind of new vaccine, I don't want to sound overdramatic, but Iron Curtain kind of thing is being drawn down around certain regions? What does that mean for those regions economically? I think it means uh, uh, economic devastation for the region, but it also means that oh, we are going to be in this uh, pandemic for, for a long haul, and not just the regions that are facing that restriction, but globally. I think uh, we have to, uh, to be, it has to be very clear to all of us that we either come out from this together or we remain in this forever, you know, regardless of whether you are vaccinated or not. So I think that the consequences, economic consequences, 
social consequences and health consequences of this kind of behavior is, is un unmanageable. And you cannot actually win the battle that we are in against this pandemic with such behaviors. Gloria, just to clarify, what ultimately does the EU approved list mean? Let's say if somebody in Africa has been vaccinated with COVID Shield and wants to go to an EU country that on a national level says, yes, we'll recognize COVID Shield, but the EU level says we don't recognize it. Where does that leave people? Uh, uh, well, probably uh, the most important uh, consequence of this uh, uh, acceptance of COVID Shield by some of, com some of the countries of the European Union is that uh, uh, people who are vaccinated with COVID Shield are exempted uh, and are recognized as protected and they can move from uh, a country to another without any uh, problem. So, so um, Gloria, does that mean that basically the EU's directive and approved list is meaningless? If it, at the end of the day, it comes down to you've got to look at what the national government health authorities say. What's the point of an EU approved <laughs> list then? Apparently, it works like that. Uh, and it is something that should not have been happened because uh, we have a, a European Union to make a decision for all of us. And uh, the decisions, however, should be shared at a level at which reasonable uh, consequences uh, are accepted by all the countries, for all the parts involved in the union. And uh, if any country um, feels the need of taking a position which is uh, different from the position of the European Union, it's a failure of the European Union itself. Max, it's not just an issue. I mean, we're focusing a lot on COVID shield for obvious reasons, since that's the one that's been, I think, the most highly distributed by the COVAX scheme. But there's also the question of the Russian vaccines and Chinese vaccines, right? They are not on the EU list. What does that mean for the world? And the idea of getting the world back to where it was before COVID, does this mean the idea of travel bubbles, the idea of travel corridors, trade corridors, are, are going to be here for the foreseeable future? This is not something that's going to end anytime soon with, with vaccines getting out. I think there's two things. I mean, I would distinguish between, uh, well, there are more than one Chinese vaccine and then the, the Russian one. Uh, the Chinese vaccine, Sinovac uh, and, and uh, Sinopharm, have both been approved by the WHO for use now. And the Russian vaccine, as I understand it, has not. So if we're looking to the World Health Organization their, and their stringent assessment of these vaccines, then that should be the bottom line. That's the bottom line for COVAX. Well, it, and it, that might need to, it maybe should be that way, Max, but it, that wasn't enough for COVID Shield, was it? The WHO has approved that and yet the EU hasn't. So it seems like yes, in, what happens in reality is a bit different from what the WHO says. Absolutely. And I think we could see more of that in the future. And if, if they'll do that for AstraZeneca, then you can see politics very much coming into play for the mm. Chinese vaccines as well. So I would definitely agree on that. But I think we need to uh, focus on the key issue here, that the vast majority of developing countries don't have enough of any vaccine at this point. And that's the key, key issue. Yes, it's problematic for travel if you have been vaccinated with another vaccine, but it's far, far more problematic if you're in Uganda at the moment, where 4,000 people out of 45 million have had two doses. I mean, it's absolutely terrible, the hoarding of vaccines going on by Europe. And I think this, this latest episode of saying that Covid Shield isn't quite right. It is a lot, for, for my mind, I think it's about defending European industries, this sense that kind of only safe vaccines can be made in Europe and America. We've seen this all the way through and we need to have a situation where we can respect the qualified vaccine manufacturers all over the world and share the recipes with them as fast as possible. And that's simply not happening. And the US has said that they're open to waiving patents on vaccines. And the main blocker is the EU and the EU led by Angela Merkel. So I think uh, they really are problematic. And I think history will frown on the EU terribly for what's happened in the last six, nine months. And the fact that they're standing by and seeing so few people vaccinated in the developing world.
Uh, maybe we'll bring Glory in for a quick uh, come in on that point. Why has Europe been so slow to get out vaccines to Africa? We heard from the African Union Special Envoy on COVID-19, Strivi Masiwa, saying not one dose, not one dose, he says, has left Europe for Africa. Again, this is a problem of the, the meaning, the, the, the deep meaning of the Union, uh, European Union. Because um, also in this context, uh, some countries uh, uh, were more prone to uh, allow the uh, send, sending vaccines to the African countries. Other countries in the European Union were uh, totally against this policy. And uh, if we are an a Euro European Union, we should decide all together <clears throat> and with a unique uh, uh, path what we should do in order to obtain safe and uh, uh, most uh, protected world uh, outside the Europe. Mm -hmm. And there is also another reason, very important reason, why we should offer uh, vaccine coverage also to European or outside European countries. Because in a country where there is a large spread of the virus and, and a partial coverage of vaccine, the development and the appearance of uh, um, resistant strains of the virus has, are much more probable. And so we have a problem altogether again. John, let me put the question this way, to be a bit, little bit of a devil's advocate on behalf of the EU. Is it not understandable, if not I, far from ideal, but is it not understandable that in a time of crisis, nations simply prioritise their own populations first? And if they, they want to make sure their populations get vaccinated first before they send out vaccines to others, it's not a huge surprise, is it, John? Uh, it is not a huge surprise, but it is not uh, a, a, a wisdom that will enable us to win an, a, a war against uh, a serious pandemic, like the one we are dealing with. Um, we know what to do. We have the solutions in our hands. But unfortunately, we are not uh, applying ourselves in a way that we can come out of this collectively. There. Of what use is it for Europe to be fully vaccinated? and Africa is not vaccinated, and you continue to get variants emerge that will challenge even the vaccines that have been used in, in Europe. I mean, we've seen how the, the variant that emerged out of South Africa uh, quickly undermine the, the, the vaccines that were being used. I think that is uh, it's just common wisdom that, uh, yes, you should protect your, your people, but understand what we are dealing with. The dimension of what we're dealing with is global. So we have to fight, look at a domestic approach, but also look at a global approach to win the battle against this pandemic. All right, I think we've got a quick minute for a final thought from Max. What does this two-tier vaccination world mean for recovery, for global growth? All those projections, the rosy projections and expectations that, yay, the world is going to grow again economically. I think it's disastrous for economic growth. I think the key point is no one blames European nations for wanting to vaccinate their own populations. What I blame them for is protecting the monopolies and the profits of their own pharma companies and not allowing those successful vaccines to be made all over the developing world. That is absolutely criminal. We could vaccinate Europe and we could vaccinate Africa. There doesn't have to be a trade-off. And we desperately need to, to see the recovery and to stop millions of people dying. Share the recipes now, Europe, and stop blocking and putting profits ahead of people. All right, maybe that humanitarian call is a good point to end on. Let's hope the world finds a way to work together to get over this. For now, let's thank our guests very much for their participation. John Inkengasong, Gloria Taliani, and Max Lawson. And thank you too for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here for now, it's goodbye. <laughs>